just quickly going live on YouTube. Just quickly going live on YouTube.
Welcome everyone to the third of the Dunning Africa webinar series. I'm very pleased uh, that we have been able to keep this idea of having a webinar on the first Thursday of every month and we hope to do this infinitely towards the future. And I'm very, very excited that uh, we have uh, once again been able to develop and attract some very interesting speakers and uh, to discuss issues that are current to Africa, that matter for Africa, and to engage with moving Africa forward. This is really, and not just Africa, but also the, we believe that Africa is at the center, as it needs to be closer to the center of the world economy. And that's really where we are pushing this. As you know, as the slogan goes, what really matters for African business? And that's what we're here to do. Now, today I'm going to actually uh, share this, the, my, the screen time with uh, some of my colleagues here. And today's in part because we're, we're do, trying to bridge a historical uh, separation within Africa between Francophone Africa and Anglophone Africa. And this is something that uh, anyone who has grown up in Africa realizes that we have this division which needs to be healed. You know, after 100 years of colonial separation, there's been a language barrier, there's been a social barrier. But those in Ang Anglophone Africa know that we are missing out on so many insights that are developed within Francophone Africa. And today the webinar is designed to draw out these things, particularly focusing on entrepreneurship education. So I'm really, really excited about this chance. And this is going to be one of many chances to bridge this divide, to bring ideas and exchange ideas across the continent. And I think really, we're on to something really important. I'm not going to hog the screen time um, as I have done in the previous two uh, events. I'm handing over today to my, uh, my colleagues uh, who will chair this even more efficiently than I have done in the past. Uh, Jean Pierre Choulet, our uh, uh, Vice Dean for Africa, um, and, uh, and also Barry Fanzel, who is the chair of our um, alumni uh, in, in South Africa, a world famous musician, a businessman, you know, a person who knows his stuff and uh, bringing together a brilliant team of people in from both Togo and Nigeria. So without further ado, I'm handing over control and I'm, I'm a control freak, so it's very difficult for me to do this. John pierre the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rajnish. I think you are making a terrible mistake to give control to a French guy and a South African guy, but uh, we are going to uh, uh, try to make you proud of this uh, very high level of uh, trust that you are putting in us. Um, good evening, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm very happy to uh, host this uh, session of the Dunning Africa Center. Uh, Barry, do you want to uh, say hello also? Uh, yes, absolutely, Jean-Pierre. And uh, thanks, many thanks to Rajnish for the for the warm, wonderful intro and, um, and also for the opportunity to host such an impactful, meaningful series for the Dunning Africa Research Center. Um, and uh, I look forward to everything that's gonna unfold with, with our panelists um, and more from me as we go. Jean-Pierre, back to you. Thank you. Um, you know, I've been uh taught by uh, Professor Rashnish Narola that it is always uh, critical to start with the why. Why are we here tonight? Uh, and what is the, the critical purpose of this uh, gathering? Let's, let's think about what happened on Friday the 24th of June. On Friday the 24th of June, Togo and Gabon uh, became members of the Commonwealth. Why? How is it that the boundaries between Francophone Africa and English speaking Africa have blasted, have been blasted by this fantastic move? And I think this uh, idea, and I think it's very much at the kernel of, of everything we are going to discuss tonight, is uh, Pan Africa. It is more tangible now that. Uh, 
if you think about the, the, the borders and if you start to open this concept, and there are a lot of initiatives, uh, the free trade agreement, uh, the SWIFT system, the financial system that would make it possible for countries in Africa to exchange money without uh, the need of a third party currency. And the fact that French speaking countries, they are now joining the Commonwealth to strengthen their ability to do trade, to exchange, to share knowledge and ideas and innovation. That's a fantastic opportunity to strengthen the Pan-African ID. That is why tonight, and we are going to play a little bit between the two languages, the French language and the English language, because uh, we have gathered a very diverse uh, uh, handful of amazing faculty tonight. So it's my great honor and pleasure to share with you who are our panelists. Professor Bernard Tosu Ashrimi from University of Lomé, l'Université de Lomé, uh, is one of our panelists, and I will hand over uh, very shortly uh, to Professor Bernard uh, Tosu Ashrimi for a brief but impactful introduction. Second panelist. Uh, Professor Herman Akwe Adotevi, also from the University of Lomé. And I have to say, uh, why are we lucky tonight to welcome uh, our two friends? They have a very, very complementary set of uh, knowledge and skills. And I'm sure you will discover in a couple of minutes uh, how um, philosophy, and communication alongside social science and entrepreneurship can uh, generate value. It's also my great honor to welcome uh, my brother from another mother, Dr. Adeinka Adewale from Henley Business School. So what is it we are going to cover in the next, uh, let's say 30, 40 minutes? We are going to, to listen, to hear from uh, Professor Bernard Ashrimi Professor uh, Akwe Adotevi and Professor Adewale. What is it they are building in Togo and in Nigeria? We are going to hear storytelling about young entrepreneurs that have been unlocked uh, to find their way to become African entrepreneurs. And that's the critical topic of today. What does it mean? Why do we have to unlock? And what does it mean to become African entrepreneurs? What is the purpose? of African entrepreneurship. And the fact that we have this dialogue between a French speaking country experience and an English speaking country experience is the kernel and the, the, the spirit of tonight's conversation. I'm not going to translate everything I've said today now, but uh, now I'm going to hand over to Professor uh, Bernard Tosu Ashrimi and I will stop you, Bernard, at some point to translate what is it you say, should you switch to French at some point. So uh, I'm going to share my screen now, if David, you allow me to do so, and uh, uh, to help, uh, to, to support what is it Bernard will, will share with us with a couple of slides. Bernard, c'est à toi. Oui, merci. Merci, Jean-Pierre. Alors, je tiens d'abord à dire combien je suis content, très heureux de cette séance qui met en relief notre très jeune institut que nous avons construit grâce à l'intervention, grâce à la, à la vision de Inle Business School et de l'Université de Lomé. Alors, merci. Donc, l'Université de Lomé... Je vais planter le décor, elle est la plus grande université du Togo. Elle est la première d'ailleurs. Euh, je dirais qu'au Togo, avant la constitution de cette université, les Togolais vont se former un peu partout, notamment en France, dans la région de Bordeaux et au Sénégal. Et à partir de 1970, il y a eu cette vision de créer cette université de Lomé. Alors, oh, if, I may, if I may, uh, Professor, I'm going to translate that. 
professor delivered a very warm welcome to all of us and uh, highlighted that uh, by itself, at its inception, the University of Lomé, uh, the, the largest and the number one university in Togo, has been set up to offer a education value proposition in Togo, where people used to go to France to get educated. So by design, the University of uh, Lomé is a value proposition, an African value proposition. Merci Jean-Pierre. Donc, euh, depuis qu'elle est installée, elle euh, s'est diversifiée avec plusieurs formations, et très attractives d'ailleurs, qui s'adaptent euh, au nouveau contexte. Alors, l'enseignant supérieur donc, a pris corps au Togo avec cette nécessité. Et parlons de ma, mon bébé qui m'est cher, l'IAUM, l'Institut Afrique-Europe de l'Institution de l'Innovation plutôt des Métiers qui est créé et qui s'inscrit dans la nouvelle dynamique de cette université, celle qui veut donner une nouvelle vision, une nouvelle gouvernance à notre université. Et la création de notre institut est venue à point nommé pour célébrer cette nouvelle dynamique. What, what Bernard is sharing with us is that, uh, and I think that's a critical uh, concept, it's the bridge concept. Although the University of Lomé is very strong from a knowledge perspective, Uh, the vision of the president of the university, Professor Kokoroko, is to strengthen the relationship, the bridge between the knowledge economy and the business economy. And what is it that Bernard and uh, Henne Business School, they have created is this institute to accelerate uh, the transformation of very good graduate students into uh, assets for the Togo economy. And that's what this institute uh, is for. Voilà. Ah, donc, je dirais donc que notre institut, l'IAEM, est le fruit d'un partenariat qui est signé entre l'Université de Lomé et le Henle Business School. Donc, euh, le premier fruit de ce partenariat est la création de cet institut, qui s'accommode parfaitement avec le contexte régional. Et puisque le Togo est un petit pays qui peut servir de catalyseur économique. Ah, donc, au travers de ce institut, on peut espérer que le Togo peut devenir donc, un centre d'éducation et de formation pour la région entière et au-delà. The, the ambition of the institute uh, is to act uh, as a hub for entrepreneurship, uh, as an incubator, that will be uh, largely and is already largely open uh, far beyond uh, Togo itself, but for the, the countries uh, around Togo. And I think it's uh, important to uh, highlight that uh, from inception, this initiative from University of Lomé to embed uh, an incubator of entrepreneurship talents in the kernel of a knowledge-driven uh, university is not limited to what is actually a small country, Togo, but is an initiative uh, building a nexus already with Nigeria, as we will learn later. And I think that's a critical uh, asset uh, that Professor uh, Ashrimi just uh, shared with us. Alors, comme vient de le dire, donc Jean-Pierre, euh, l'entrepreneuriat est le point d'ancrage de nos formations et aussi de l'innovation. Donc, les deux angles de, de formation que développe notre institut entrepreneuriat, innovation et tout ce qui va avec tout cette, toute cette problématique. Alors, pour soutenir les formations au sein de l'AUM, on organise des conférences thématiques. Évidemment, l'Institut doit avoir des, des, des domaines de travail et les conférences sont, font partie de ces domaines. Et pour marquer cela, nous avons choisi une thématique très, très intéressante qu'on appelle les avenues du site. Et dans cette thématique, nous allons décliner les conférences de temps en temps. Déjà, nous avons eu à faire deux conférences, grâce d'ailleurs à l'équipe de Jean-Pierre, euh, venu de Inle Business School, avec comme conférencier le professeur Chepes. Et il y a eu deux conférences qui sont déjà déroulées. La première, nous avions parlé des écosystèmes d'innovation et de transformation structurelle. Et la dernière, qui est très récente, 
et qui est au cœur de l'actualité, c'est la guerre en Ukraine. Enjeu et opportunité. Une conférence qui a mobilisé beaucoup de, de foules au Togo et qui a eu un impact très fort à Lomé. L'Université de, 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 de Lomé a, a, eu, a marqué, a, a participé aussi tant soit peu à cette actualité de la guerre de l'Ukraine. It's, it's always, a, uh, and we, we know that, we all know that one of the critical issues of uh, our education system in Africa is that we graduate thousands of people, but there is a lot of unemployment. And in the meantime, the uh, business uh, society, they struggle to find talents. So what is it we have started to do there is to uh, deliver more practical knowledge about what is it that is the first uh, so we we set up a series of conference and one of the first conference has been uh, and the 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 idea of this conference is to talk about the future of the south if i may and one of the first conference has been about uh, actually what what are the innovation ecosystems that are available for uh, entrepreneurs and for small and medium enterprise. Let's be very practical and start with a map, a mapping of these uh, ecosystems. How to, uh, from inception, think of your entrepreneur uh, endeavor with uh, export opportunities to Europe and beyond. And the second one is how to transform the war in Ukraine by assessing the challenge, but also highlighting the opportunities. And the two conferences that have been delivered in partnership between University of Lomé and Henley Business School, they have gathered uh, a very significant number of people and they have opened their eyes and, and helped the young entrepreneurs to identify opportunities. But of course, the Institute is doing more and Professor Ashrimi, we are going to learn that now the, the Institute is equipping uh, young, uh, bright students uh, in Togo with uh, critical skills to become entrepreneurs. Maxi, la formation étant un de nos objectifs euh, euh, principaux, ou un de nos objectifs principaux plutôt, nous avions formé une première cohorte de for d'étudiants. Euh, 40 étudiants ont été formés à l'entrepreneuriat avec euh, une équipe euh, bien huilée venue de l'Université School, Business School plutôt avec à, la tête, à sa tête Jean-Pierre et notre cher ami Adéenka. Ils sont venus avec, en collaboration avec eux. Nous avons formé 40 étudiants qui ont été, qui ont été primés au travers d'une grande cérémonie que, qui a mobilisé tout le corps enseignant de l'Université de Lomé et toute la gouvernance qui ont participé à cette séance ou bien à l'issue de cette formation. Il y a eu un certificat qui a été délivré à ces étudiants. Ces jeunes sont suivis et peuvent constituer un vivier pour l'entrepreneuriat au Togo. Ils sont d'ailleurs en ligne. Certains d'eux peuvent témoigner. Alors, l'entrepreneuriat fait aujourd'hui partie des pistes privilégiées par le gouvernement togolais pour permettre aux jeunes sortant du système éducatif de s'intégrer professionnellement. Donc, l'appui de l'Ele Business School au travers de notre institut constitue un point important dans la formation des jeunes au Togo et qui s'accommode, je le redis encore, à la politique de l'emploi de notre gouvernement. Et pour finir, je dirais donc que l'Université de Lomé et le Business School constituent un mariage très fort pour participer à ce développement du Togo. Merci donc à notre équipe, merci à le Business School, l'institut que je dirige va tout faire pour que cela Advienne. Merci à vous. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm going to translate that. We all know that the Dunning Africa Center is uh, research driven. It's, it, 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 its focus is, of course, to, to build a connectivity between research and economic impact to support international business. So, what is it we are doing in uh, Togo? somehow is a laboratory, it's a prototype. And Adenka, in a couple of minutes, will uh, highlight uh, the research that he is conducting alongside Professor Achrimi and Professor uh, Herman Akwe Adotevi about it. 
But I want to share with you an amazing finding. For years, the students, the 40 students, they have been trained at University of Lomé. Again, one of the best university in Africa. They have been trained. They have received an amazing curriculum from their faculty there. But they were looking at entrepreneurship from the other side of the bank, from the other side of the river. What we have built by joining forces, uh, University of Lomé and Henne Business School. You know that Henne Business School is one of the oldest business schools in the UK. Year after year, decades after decades, we have built a framework for entrepreneurship. And thanks to our campus in South Africa and to the amazing work that uh, Dr. Adeinka and Professor Andrew Godley are doing, we are now working on an African framework for entrepreneurship. So what is it we have done? In a couple of weeks time, we have been able to transform young graduates looking at entrepreneurship from the other side of the river into entrepreneurs. I dare to say that these 40 students, although they, they were conscious that entrepreneurship might be an opportunity, but now they have been unlocked through this framework. They have onboarded the incubator that uh, Adeinka, Bernard and Herman we are working on. And they have uh, set up their entrepreneurial project. They have received uh, funding to get supported. That's a critical part of the platform. And I'm sure Adeinka will allude to that. And now they have started their journey uh, to the entrepreneurial route. And I would like uh, to hand over for just one or two minutes to Remy, one of these students. Remy, I would be delighted. Remy, s'il vous plaît, uh, dans un format très compressé. Je sais que c'est difficile. Une petite minute, deux minutes maximum. Est-ce que vous pouvez témoigner uh, comment l'expérience que vous avez vécue avec nous uh, a transformé votre vision de l'entrepreneuriat? et vous aide maintenant à vous considérer comme un entrepreneur, bien que ça ne soit pas facile. Rien n'est idéal, il y a des, des combats à mener. Mais aujourd'hui, Rémi, est-ce que vous pourriez témoigner un petit peu, y compris des difficultés, mais de ce chemin vers l'entrepreneuriat qui a été enclenché Ok. Oui, monsieur. Euh, je voudrais, avant toute chose... Canyou, est-ce que vous pouvez mettre votre caméra, Rémi Ça serait formidable de vous voir, parce que ah on ne vous voit pas. Oh, où est-ce que je peux le faire, euh, caméra Je suis sûr que vous allez trouver. Can you switch your camera on, Rémi You may have switched it off. Oui. Yes. Ça vient C'est bon C'est bon. bon, on vous voit, on vous entend. À vous, pour deux minutes, le... Le, la scène est à vous, Rémi. OK. Et je voudrais, avant toute chose, dire un sincère merci au professeur Atremi et au professeur Akwe de leur initiative qui consiste à former les jeunes euh, dans l'idée de nous envoyer, bien, de nous aider à avoir euh, un emploi décent. Je voudrais... Thank you, thank you, Professor Achrimi and, and Professor Akoué Adotevi to support the entrepreneurship uh, initiative and to support how to transform job into job creators. Combien de fois je dois exprimer ma gratitude au Professor Adeika de sa formation? Je voudrais dire qu'il était la hauteur de la formation qu'il nous avait donnée. J'en suis fier et je voudrais à cette occasion lui dire un sincère merci. Thank you, Professor Adeinka, for the time and the commitment that uh, you gave to us to transform uh, our, ourselves. Professor uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, au nom de l'équipe de Lomé, je voudrais vous dire un sincère merci de votre esprit que vous avez pour aider la jeunesse africaine. I'm not going to translate that because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm too shy. But roughly speaking, Rémi has uh, shared okay. with us a lot of thank you. Maintenant, okay. Rémi, on veut, on veut oui. entendre votre propre expérience. Voilà. Il faut le dire qu'avant cette formation, je ne connaissais pas du tout 
que le domaine entrepreneurial est un domaine aussi porteur d'emploi. I, I, I didn't know before the training that entrepreneurship and employability were related. Mais avec cette formation, j'avoue que eh, le professeur Deinka nous a nous a permis d'avoir l'esprit d'ouverture sur les opportunités, sur les affaires. This training has unlocked my understanding that entrepreneurship is a route to employability. Et non seulement il nous a ouvert les yeux sur euh, les possibilités d'affaires, il nous a dans la vie donné aussi une vision, une, euh, un esprit d'ouverture dans la vie en général. The unexpected outcome for me, and I think for my colleagues, has been that not only this training has opened opportunities in terms of business, but has been a game changer in terms of personal development. Au cours de cette formation, nous avions appris beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de choses. Et je voudrais tout simplement résumer tout ça là en une formule en disant que eh, au cours de cette formation, nous avions acquis eh, comment est-ce qu'on peut monter un carnaval d'affaires, monter un projet qui peut être bancable. The, the, the experience that I want to share with you is that uh, through the training, we discovered the business canvas, the power of the business canvas, of this practical driven uh, approach to uh, forge a value proposition, and that we are now applying it to our project. It's a major finding because we didn't meet with this uh, concept before, although we have been well trained, and it is a major finding for us, a very practical tool we have been equipped with. Je voudrais pour finir témoigner à nouveau notre gratitude à cette équipe pilotée par le professeur Achilini et vous tous, de tout ce que vous faites à l'endroit de la jeunesse africaine et en particulier à la jeunesse togolaise. Merci Rémi, un grand merci pour votre témoignage, c'était très précis. Uh, Rémi uh, uh, wanted to thank all of us again. Let me, let me share with you. Why is it that we are receiving such a level of gratitude? It's not, it's not uh, a testimonial uh, to the glory of Fenle or University of Lomé. Nobody cares of that. It's more profound. The youths in Africa, in Pan-Africa, whatever level of education they get, struggle to find their way to employment. Whereas big firms, companies, they struggle to find talents. And the reason why I think there is so much gratitude tonight, again, it's, it's, it's not to the glory of anything. It's because the framework of the African framework of entrepreneurship that we and others are working on is unlocking this critical uh, concern is building a bridge between the knowledge economy, this fantastic reservoir of talents, and the business economy. But nothing would be possible without uh, identity and consciousness. Rien n'est possible sans un portefeuille de valeurs philosophiques pour soutenir cette démarche. Et je suis très heureux maintenant de passer la parole au professeur euh, Herman Akouéa Dotevi, qui va nous donner une vision euh, de positionnement de valeur sur cette démarche euh, qui est en cours entre l'Université de Lomé et euh, Henley Business School. Professeur Akouéa Dotevi, la parole est à vous. Euh, Jean-Pierre, merci, je vous prie. Dire merci également au professeur Ashnish Narula pour, euh, je dirais, l'impact du Dunning Africa Center pour euh, euh, l'écosystème économique africain. Euh, je voudrais, euh, pour ma part, euh, revenir sur euh, ce qui caractérise euh, l'IAEM et son partenariat avec euh, Henley Business School, 
dans sa mission d'impacter positivement et efficacement, je dois dire, euh, euh, l'écosystème entrepreneurial togolais et sous-régional. So what, what Herman is going to share with us is that uh, this uh, experiment, this initiative, the Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship in partnership between our two universities has the ambition to impact the uh, economic environment and is supported as such by the Togolese uh, government. Uh, uh, et donc, dans cette perspective, uh, uh, je, je résume uh, uh, cette mission qui a déjà commencé à faire des, des, ses preuves en trois notions clés qui, pour moi, uh, uh, sont des, des concepts gagnants, des coûts gagnants dans l'écosystème économique africain. Innover, partager et réseauter. So the three concepts that are underpinning this is innovation or to innovate, to share and to build the nexus to network. Et, et si je prends le, le premier, la première notion qui est l'innovation, euh, euh, je crois que l'Institut, l'IAEM, est, est déjà une innovation, est une grande innovation euh, dans le monde académique togolais parce que euh, c'est un institut qui est créé sur la base d'un partenariat. Toutes les institutions que nous avons à l'université n'ont pas cette source ou ce fondement à leur création. C'est un institut qui est créé sur la base d'un partenariat. Et quel partenariat Un partenariat avec une école de commerce, une école de business. C'est déjà un signe fort en termes d'innovation à l'université de Lomé et dans notre euh, société togolaise. Everybody of the, the political complexity uh, in higher education in Africa, elsewhere in the world, of course, but today we are focusing in Africa. And that's why Professor Herman specifically highlighted that from inception, a French, a francophone university decided to partner with an English speaking business school to bring practicality to accelerate Uh, the link between knowledge and business economy. This innovation driver is at the kernel of the concept that uh, we are developing. Et donc, euh, euh, la perspective qui est euh, envisagée par ce partenariat, euh, c'est d'abord que euh, l'Institut IAEM euh, a la vocation d'insuffler l'esprit de l'innovation aux autres établissements de l'Université de Lomé. Euh, euh, C'est dans cette perspective que la formation euh, animée par euh, Adelita et Jean-Pierre euh, ont été données à des étudiants euh, que nous avions euh, regroupés venant de plusieurs disciplines, de plusieurs formations qui n'avaient pas un passé en termes de formation entrepreneuriale, mais qui n'ont que leurs spécialités diverses comme étant une base pour passer d'un point A, qui est le point de non-entrepreneuriat, au point B, qui est le, le point qui débloque leur esprit, le potentiel créatif, en leur donnant euh, euh, tous les outils qui leur permettent de saisir les opportunités et les ressources nécessaires au développement d'un projet entrepreneurial. Herman, euh, professeur euh, Herman, just shared with us, one of the critical components, intellectual components of the Institute. It's not another organizational layer in silos of the University of Lomé. It's a cross initiative. Is it about skill transfer? A little bit. Is it about uh, training? Of course, but it's actually critically about uh, the key components, unlock mindset, And this is a cross uh, initiative, pluri multidisciplinary initiative, target, uh, onboarding students from all the, the academic areas of the University of Lomé to unlock their entrepreneurial mindset. Because there is an in, intimate conviction that Adenka will share with us that the pathway to unlock entrepreneurship is also the pathway to improve employability in Africa. 
Merci, merci Jean-Pierre. Et donc, ce, ce qui me permet d'aller au second concept que, parmi les trois que j'ai mis en avant, euh, euh, partager. Donc, en mettant ensemble des, des étudiants ou bien des, des, des gens venant de plusieurs disciplines de spécialités diverses, la formation que l'IAEM a donnée avec, euh, en appui, euh, Jean-Pierre lui-même et Adéinka, a permis de créer une situation de partage de connaissances et d'expériences qui, qui, pour moi, est comme le fondement de l'éclosion des projets innovants. What is, what is uh, worth highlighting is that the, the sharing of knowledge and somehow the practical uh, uh, sharing of experience and, 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 and has been enough to unlock uh, the behavior of our students, develop their self-confidence and, and make them start their journey. Et donc, euh, euh, comme l'a rappelé mon collègue tout de suite, euh, euh, Bernard, euh, euh, c'est que les conférences thématiques sur les avenirs du Sud euh, rentrent dans la perspective de ce partage de connaissances et d'expériences pour euh, 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 impacter efficacement l'écosystème entrepreneurial national, régional et international. Uh, the ambition of the of the institute is, is, is to be able to build a nexus of partners uh, in Togo, beyond Togo. And we have started with Nigeria, where we have also uh, connected a couple of partners uh, with this Pan-African idea that uh, African ownership of Africa is critical. And if we are able to join force, and, and, and I'm alluding to something that the Inca will, 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 will we deep dive into. If we are able to shape an African framework for entrepreneurship, building from what is it we, we know about the, the, the bridge, the necessary bridge between knowledge and business, then uh, we, we will have fulfilled the ambition of this institute. It is an innovation in the Togolese academic world, But maybe more than that, Professor Herman. Merci, oui. Euh, 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 bien sûr, plus que ça, cette formation a, a donné à nos jeunes entrepreneurs euh, un, un atout, je dirais, un atout énorme. Parce que il a, ça, la formation a permis de les réseauter. C'est ce qui me permet d'arriver au dernier point de mon intervention, euh, le réseautage. Ils, ont, ils sont déjà en réseau eux-mêmes en tant que vivier de jeunes entrepreneurs, euh, mais ils ont également bénéficié du réseautage de Henley Business School. Pour de jeunes entrepreneurs, c'est un appui considérable qui les rassure et, et leur donne confiance dans leur démarche entrepreneuriale. The, the connectivity to the, the Henley Business School Network of Entrepreneurship is is instrumental because not only have we delivered the training on the ground, but instantly all the, the young entrepreneurs, they have been connected to uh, the NA Business School Network. I just want to take one example. Uh, they, they entered 40 students, but now it's eight, uh, almost startup. And the eight almost startup they have received a uh, financial support from the NA Business School African Innovation Fund to move to the next step. That's something that has a an, an, an critical impact on uh, their ability to forge the project and to move from uh, job seeker to job creators. Je voudrais finir en disant que le, 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 ce qu'on peut retenir de cette stratégie innover, partager, réseauter, c'est que en mettant en avant cette démarche, euh, l'IAEM a, a contribué au développement des capacités de réseautage et de mobilité de jeunes entrepreneurs afin de transformer le marché national et sous-régional en un écosystème innovant. Je crois que c'est ça la mission de l'IAEM et c'est la mission que l'IAEM confie à ces jeunes entrepreneurs 
qui ont été euh, excellemment formés par euh, Adenika et, et Jean-Pierre Chouet. Merci. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Herman. And uh, the professor was highlighting again uh, that the, the, the whole initiative, uh, again, it's a prototype, it's research by, by design, is about uh, the design of an African framework for entrepreneurship. And uh, with the conviction that this uh, framework is scalable, and we, that's why it is beyond Togo, and we are going to listen in a minute about the Nexus initiative and, and a, more about this framework from Professor Adenka. Our intimate conviction as a team, we are a team, all of us, the, the four of us, and, and maybe, maybe more beyond, is that should we get it correct should we get this framework correct? And again, it's not the Silicon Valley type of framework that we're trying to project here. It's to build, whilst working, a genuine entrepre African entrepreneurship framework. Should we get it right? Should we get it correct? Then it will catalyze economic value in Togo, in West Africa and beyond. That's the main idea that we are pursuing. I can see in the chat, a couple of questions about, but can you share more about the uh, African entrepreneurship framework? Of course we can. And I'm going now to hand over to uh, Professor Adeinka Dewale from Henley Business School to deep dive into uh, this uh, concept of uh, how to unlock entrepreneurship uh, behavior and make it a catalyzer, a catalyst to transform job seekers, well-educated, but job seekers into job creators, impacting the economy. Professor Adeinka, floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Pierre. And um, hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you this afternoon. And I'd like to extend my warmest thanks to dear friends and colleagues from the University of Lomé, Professor Bernard, Professor Herman, for I'm sharing those wonderful insights with us. And um, as you have rightly said, Jean-Pierre, I do have an adverse task of trying to share the kernel of the framework we've been working on um, in as few minutes as possible. And then we will be more than happy to take a deeper dive um, and explore what this framework means or what it looks like. But sort of to, to bell the cut, as many of us may very much be aware on the call, is that perhaps there is this there is no shortage of entrepreneurial activities on the continent. That much we know. We can piece together streams of different trends. And if there's anything at all that will even further um, accentuate or punctuate what I've just said is that if we look at the ongoing tech revolution, which by every means is not happening as a first wave, from my own perception, where as Africa, we are in our third wave of digital revolution, um, we will immediately, of course, agree that with the um, boom in the tech ecosystems and in the rise of different sort of um, avenues and platforms um, where we have tech entrepreneurs domiciling across the continent. And I think there are over about 243 of these sort of hubs where um, young entrepreneurs, um, you know, come together to build and to work together on the ideas and they they do mask themselves also in form of co-working spaces but generally you know in terms of tech hubs around the continent there's quite a lot of them booming all of these are obvious indicators um, to the volume of entrepreneurship activities happening on the continent but also um, if we look in the in the very informal sector which we mustn't forget when we have conversations about Africa we know obviously that we do have a lot of volume happening there. Um, and, and for me um, and, and for the rest of the team, when we started on this journey a few years ago, we acknowledged that indeed we do have this volume of activities and I'm, and I'm very excited about the volume, but I'm particularly worried about the translation of volume into quality. And I think that for us is the background and the start of this entire adventure. How do we get this quantity to become quality? And what do we mean by quality? Primarily what we mean by quality is to really build 
businesses that will make active contribution to the wider economy, contribution to the GDP, contribution to reducing unemployment, um, which again ties back to a trend or a theme that has emerged so far in the conversation about how building job creators actually also solves the problem of job seekers, or perhaps by building job creators, we may actually be building better job seekers. However, where you want to look at it, it's like killing um, two birds with one stone. Um, but, the, but the real essence here is that we want to transform quantity into quality. Um, and we want to bridge that gap by ensuring that we have successfully marketed and monetized innovations. Um, from the existing quantity of innovation activities and business activities on the continent. Uh, and so, in a way, if we look at the various types of interventions that are currently going on on the continent, and I do, with every sense of humility, acknowledge that we are, ours is not the only intervention, and of course we expect it not to be because this is such a hydra-headed issue that we have so many other colleagues and organizations across the continent doing amazing work, which I do recognize and respect, and we all acknowledge that. But again, we see that some of these activities tend to move towards advocating for more innovation activities. But for us, we keep saying that the volume is there, it's the quality that is missing. And so the big question for us is how do we, if we move on to the next slide, is how do we transform this mass army of job seekers. Again, I must emphasize that on the continent, we do have, in fact, in some countries, policies that does support some sort of entrepreneurship education. In Nigeria, for example, since 2006, 16 years, we've had an entrepreneurship education policy in place in Nigeria that mandated universities to, to embed entrepreneurship education within their curricula. This has been going on for 16 years in Nigeria. If, but, but again, we look at something that should have been happening for 16 years and we're still asking these fundamental questions. Is there any way to track the impact of this initiative, of this policy? And why, are, why aren't we seeing more um, within the university system and more spin-offs happening from our university education or perhaps Another question to ask is what might be the focus, the vision, the mission, the objectives of these policies in the first place? And perhaps we're still not getting, these policies are not really targeting the real issue. So we do have a bucket of conversation to have there, which is not for this evening, obviously, but, but to sort of walk you through the framework as we would have it. If, we, if you agree with me that the volume of what we have on the continent in terms of entrepreneurial activities is there, if you agree with me that there are so many macro contextual forces that have driven or have whipped up what we'll call the entrepreneurial appetite in young people, and as a sort of working fact, Africa is the only continent in the world where we have more female entrepreneurs than male entrepreneurs. And that is an important fact to also note. So for those who are interested in gender lens entrepreneurship, that's an interesting fact to pay attention to, which this project is also obviously paying close attention to. And so if you agree with me that we do have all these streams and trends that have sort of emerged to sort of show us that there's volume on the continent, there is no lack of appetite of people desiring to get into entrepreneurship. And I also often say, we do have a lot more necessity-driven entrepreneurs than opportunity-driven entrepreneurs. And necessity-driven entrepreneurship is really informed by the fact that we do have problems um, you know, with our economies and people just want to make ends meet and getting into some sort of side hustle, having some sort of small business or micro business is a default reaction to wanting to add to their um, whatever income they make from jobs, if those jobs are there, because again, unemployment rates are ridiculously high across the continent. So in a way, the first box here, as you will see, is what we'll call the endowment box. And it's the box that speaks to entrepreneurship desires and the, and the passion, which is never lacking. But the question is, in spite of all of this passion, why are we not having people building you know, innovations or businesses that are investable, businesses that are, you know, recruiting or getting, creating jobs at scale 
that will sort of transform our economies and make us archetypes of these so-called innovative economies. It is because at the foundation of it is that education or entrepreneurship education is fundamentally a problem. Access to, fun- to entrepreneurship education at times is out of reach. If you think about it, um, quality entrepreneurship education, if I may add, we do have access to some sort of form of entrepreneurship education in whatever at whatever level you want to consider it. But in terms of quality entrepreneurship education, which has the end, obviously, of giving people the skills and unlocking capabilities towards harnessing their potential and putting those capabilities together towards building businesses, that is where the real problem is. And so with what we've done with our projects is that we often at the very start of our projects and as at my count, and I, and, and I think John Pierre could help me here, as at my count, across at least three African countries, Nigeria, Ghana, and Togo, we have tested this model with, in an excess of about 300 people, 300 candidates that have gone through this whole program. And so we're speaking with data that we have collected across the last three, three and a half years with 300 participants, that is young Africans who have engaged in this whole journey with us. And what we have discovered is that by measuring appetite for entrepreneurship, uh, you know, motivation at the beginning, appetite on, and entrepreneurship capabilities and skills at the very start, we often discover that there is this hidden fear and, and, and rightly so, because Africa is typified by high levels of uncertainty and very limited resources. And it is within this very difficult context that a lot of people are expected to engage to build businesses. And that's why we also have extremely high failure rates, as you will find through some of the well-known published studies, World Economic Forum, World Bank, very high failure rates. And so, but what we did discover is that by bringing a dedicated management education or business and management education to this group of people in a very unique pedagogical style, which we can't go into this afternoon because we, um, as educators, we are also particular, not just about what we deliver, but how we deliver it to good effect. We have discovered that at the end of the program, when we measure things like appetite and, and propensity to want to build entrepreneurship or shift in entrepreneurial disposition and mindset. Um, I'm just giving you an average of our data is that whilst at the very beginning, um, about 60 to 70% of participants will often say no to entrepreneurship, largely because they know it's difficult or they assume it's extremely difficult. We can't do this. We don't even want to get into this. In other words, about only about 20 to 30% of participants will say, well, we want to get into entrepreneurship because we think it's the way to go. At the end of our programs, usually we have the 20% um, or, the, or the 60% of people saying no. We then have 95% of people saying yes to entrepreneurship and saying, well, this is actually an amazing opportunity and that my mindset has been changed. And that's really what we call the concept of unlocking. For us, the concept of unlocking is the concept of the shift in mindset towards entrepreneurship that makes entrepreneurship not a distant reality that can be felt, but that makes successful entrepreneurship a near reality that can actually be lived. And that for us is very exciting and very important through what we deliver. And by making that happen with this group of people, young people, what we begin to see is that there is this appetite to say, I'm going to build something. And that's where we have capabilities and what we call unlocked assets. But um, Jean-Pierre and I and my colleagues from University of Lume quickly realized that that wasn't going to be the end of the story. In fact, it was only the beginning of the journey. So unlocked assets are now, you know, yes, let's go, let's build something. Then they begin to build and then they get into another, another quagmire. And that quagmire is that, number one, they are isolated from the ecosystem. Now, those of us who work, who who understand what what it means to take an idea to the market, and I do work with a lot of people, both in the social innovation space and in the business space, to work from idea to the market. It is impossible to do this in isolation. The chances of success is increased significantly when you build in connection within an ecosystem of support. And so for us, we discovered that the isolation problem became very real very quickly. 
how do I access funding? How do I get in touch with existing industry players? How do I find mentors and partnerships? How do I build, you know, in a way that will help me really sort of do this in a, in a relevant way within the context I'm trying to build something useful? All of these became questions a lot of our young people began to face. And like Jean-Pierre rightly mentioned, we then realized that we had to build another innovation that would address that particular gap. And that innovation tries to de-isolate them by bringing connectivity to the innovation ecosystem. Now, those of us who know what this means in terms of practical sense is that once these young people are taken from their high level of reluctance to wanting to build, to actually wanting to build something, their propensity to wanting to build is further enhanced when they realize that they are doing it within a community. That, in its essence, is a very African thing. And we call it Afro-communitarianism in principle. We build, we, we know the spirit of Ubuntu, I am because we are. Suddenly, we're putting people in a community of practice that is building different business ventures. And and in terms of what these entrepreneurs are building, we have entrepreneurs ranging from those using technology to, to solve payment solution problems to um, entrepreneurs who are in the creative space wanting to build, do stuff in music, film, fashion. I mean, it's a whole land, it's a whole plethora of things happening with these young entrepreneurs. So in a way for us, we have built this system that not just unlocks them, but de-isolates them by connecting them to an, to, a, to, an, to, a, to an innovation ecosystem. Now, that said, what we have is a system that transforms potential into capabilities, but also capabilities into sustainable businesses. And that for us is really the exciting thing that we have been doing. So in conclusion, just to um, the final slide, jump here from my end, is that what we do realize is that there are some myths that surround the existing structure of the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem in Africa. And we have to be very careful when we are unpacking Africa as a context. Number one is that we can't assume that we don't have innovation ecosystems. We do have them. In fact, if you look at all the different players, that make up, should make up a functional innovation ecosystem. They all exist in Africa. We have a public sector. Different African countries have governments with initiatives targeting young um, entrepreneurs. And we cannot always say the government is at fault. We have the private sector. We have universities across Africa. Cutting edge research in our universities is there. We have development organizations. We have financial institutions and investors. We have innovation spaces. The question is, why are we still not getting the benefits of value creation and value capture through thriving innovation ecosystems? I believe one of the reasons is because each of these actors may be operating in silos. And for us, the big objective now is to break those silos down and allow for better cross-fertilization and collaboration. And that's where we begin to see on the right things like appreciating the fact that academic institutions, their roles have to change. Universities will have to see their roles change. The whole idea of entrepreneurship education as we currently have it in our university systems has to evolve beyond just teaching. And this is where the partnership with the University of Lume and Henley Business School is very critical because we are building what I will call a best practice case of what it means to build from ground up entrepreneurship unlocking and connectivity um, programs that will not just, that will sort of immediately involve the wider ecosystem in its evolution and its development, such that a lot of the young people get supported from ground up. So whilst we're unlocking them, they're already getting connectivity into the ecosystem. And with that, our hypothesis, which is currently being tested, is that we stand a better chance of reversing the failure rate in Africa of 85% failure rates for startups to 85% success rate, whilst at the same time limiting and transforming the idea of quantity into quality businesses that would actually then build the Africa of our dreams. That's it from me. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Adinka. What I, have, what I have understood there, and we are going to hand over to uh, the room, I'm still using this old-fashioned concept for questions. What 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 we have realized uh, through your presentation is that the, 
there is an amazing asset there. If we think about things that we are hearing those days, oh, fantastic, uh, American money is coming to Africa to invest into entrepreneurship. In some way, we should be uh, paying attention to that. It's a positive signal, but it's, it's a frightening, it's a threat. Are we going to let them take it all again? Are we going to let the North take it all again? Are we going to let the North buy innovation, entrepreneurship, talents, human assets again? What we intimately understand, what we want to demonstrate is to say no to that and to unlock human assets, to unlock entrepreneurship behavior, and then furthermore, to unlock African investment, to take ownership of African entrepreneurship. Barry Van Zyl, I hand over to you to get the audience warmed up, fire to trigger questions. We are here, the four of us, ready to take any type of questions. Fantastic. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Um, perhaps we should stop the screen share at this point. So if anybody wants to pop up in uh, gallery view and, and I think can take, um, can take charge of their mics, uh, they can ask questions in real time and um, also in the chat, which I'll be observing. Uh, excuse me for my slightly shadowy, bright uh, um, lighting here, but uh, I'm 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 working with one little LED light as the as we as we lost the the power in South Africa. Talking about entrepreneurial challenges. That's your worldwide so, musician spirit is back. Your your that's, stage. That's, is back. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so the, there's, there's some clear themes that emerged on a broad level here for me tonight, which, is, which has just been absolutely fantastic. And if I, give them in, if I give three sort of key concepts, there's been this idea of unlocking. There's been this um, masterful description of quantity, over, uh, uh, qu quantity and quality and the, the focus needing to be on, needing to be on quality. And, and then central to everything that everybody's been sharing has, this, has been this idea of mindset, the, the personal development aspects or personal effectiveness aspects. And this is something that I think is pivotal in this, in this whole entrepreneurial conversation. And I, I've, I've been lucky enough to see um, Adienka in action many times in the classroom. And I know what a, what a great... Um, what a great academic performer and rock star he is. And central to, to the very powerful interventions that he delivers is this idea of changing mindsets. And um, both, uh, uh, both professors Bernard, uh, Herman, and, and also um, Remy all, uh, all mentioned, the, 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 the student that shared his experiences, all mentioned this idea of raising self-awareness and raising mindset. So it was interesting to me that it came out as a central theme. Um, what, what, what I found uh, very uh, um, uh, pivotal and fascinating in terms of uh, Henley is that the feedback from Henley MBA students has also been the idea of entrepreneurial training um, and the MBA training raising mindsets. So it's something that's central to to Henley's DNA and, and, and emerging as a as a a secret source, as a as a, you know, for want of a better word, in in Henley's portfolio. So, the 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 floor is yours, everybody, and uh, I'm going to start the I'm going to start the the, the um, proceedings by asking this, and I'm going to put this out to all three profs. This idea of uh, graduates not being ready to to integrate economically and and, and graduating from school. From, uh, from tertiary education, but not being able to enter the, mark, the job market and perhaps uh, um, failing to find work while the job market's failing to find talent. In, in terms of the, pr the practical closing of the gap with this training and um, the, the, the idea of instantiating the abstract of, uh, of entrepreneurial training as a, as a theory to an actual practical skill set and a toolkit that people can use straight away, I'd love to hear some more thoughts about um, how that process unfolds. So um, 
Adienka and uh, and professors Bernard and Hermann, I'd love to hear what you what you, uh, 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 what uh, you let's, have. Uh, let's 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 note the question. Uh, yep. and, and maybe if we can gather a couple of questions from the audience to be sure we don't we don't miss uh, interactivity with the audience. I track I track record of this very good question to be sure okay. we, we will get through it. But I I don't want to miss the opportunity of, of questions from the audience because I can see the room is warming up there. Absolutely, a well spotted job. Yeah, I wasn't seeing any questions and I was I was jumping in there to 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 light the fire, but I see that. Uh, Judson Addy has just raised a hand. So why don't we why don't we start right there? Um, is is Judson able to to speak on the mic, David, or does he have to um, put the question in the chat? I, I think he'll have to put it on the chat. Uh, no, okay. he can speak right. now. There, there's so, also so. a question from uh, Dineo. Uh, Justin, Justin, you can, you can, uh, Justin, you can raise, you can ask your question just by unmuting yourself. You are, you are on the stage. You just have to unmute yourself. And if you have an issue, you can, you can very easily put it in the chat, and I'll read it out. Yeah, I, I think there is some limitation to people joining in, but come, it'll come back to the software. Um, uh, Can I? Yeah. Thank you, Jetson. Uh, floor, floor is yours. Thank you. I just want to inform you that uh, one, the subject matter you've been addressed is um, quite important. We've recognized that one of the biggest problem we've had over the years is that there has been an absence of a linkage between academia, <clears throat> excuse me, academia and uh, the private sector, widening right skill sets needed for the private sector. So what we're doing at the African Private Sector Summit is we're trying to bring academia and, uh, and, and the, so that uh, we can have this level of interaction to respond to the skill set needs of the of the private sector. This required the mapping up at the country level of what the requirements are needed in the job market to transform your natural resources as well as provide the uh, support services needed uh, at the country level. And this can be replicated across continent so in doing this in doing this we've we established we're in the process of establishing the african education trust fund can support all of the universities across the continent in this respect if you are that all should here to get in touch with the uh, association of african university or the higher education at the au represented by uh, uh, dr amin of uh, egypt uh, if you're here on this platform from the private sector, I urge you to get in touch with either the African Paris Sector Summit or the Pan Africa Chamber of Commerce. The African Business Council, which is the representative body of the private sector at the EU, uh, is part of this uh, effort, uh, and uh, but it is still in the teething process. It was recently established. Uh, we recently elected the president, who happens to be an Egyptian, Dr. Amani Asfud. So things are in the works. You all to do is to let us work together as a for a common cause, for a common force. So we speak with one voice: the the private sector, the academia, TVET, CSOs, as well as labor. Speak with one voice because. All of the problems, be, be practical about it. The problems we have across the continent emanates from who? The politicians. They do not consult the private sector on formulating the policies, all right? They do not consult the universities on the formulating of policies for the country. They do things in their own interests. And I think if we can collectively come together and speak with one voice on these subjects, all right, we'll be making some advancement. 
This also brings me to the issue of, of, of uh, democracy, the series of meetings taking place on democracy. If the constituency, the universities across the, across the collaborate, all right, if the private sector will collaborate on, on structural issues, okay, we then can make an impact in terms of the, 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 the whole, uh, it, with respect to the issue of democracy. Now, for the private sector to truly function across the continent, all right, we can, we can no longer rely on the politicians. Here's a practical example. Here you commission, listen to me carefully. EU Commission is distinct from the EU itself. The EU is the political body. The Commission is the policy formulating body. They have now the the uh, in ACTA and the EU Commission, who's to be uh, in the private sector. All right. So where are we in all of this? The private sector, academia, CSO, and labors must stand up together to make a difference. I just want to make this comment. And I ask you all to please let us work together as a common force to resolve some of the problems on the continent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jason. It's a, it's a fantastic uh somehow confirmation that uh, we are not alone with these uh, convictions uh, to uh, bridge and bundle uh, the knowledge economy, the academic uh, assets with the private sector. It's of critical importance. Lineo, um, you, you raised a couple of questions in the chat and I, I, I would love for you to to step in and, and, and share your views and maybe raise a question. Uh, would you would you be happy, Lineo, to, to, to do, it, do it now? I'm putting the the light on you, but I'm sure you will you will uh, overcome that. I'm trying to get Mr. Uh, Lineo Rasekoala on stage with a question I know he has. Let, let me let me while we're waiting for Lineo uh, to join in, let me just kind of paraphrase. I can't, uh, I can't realize Professor Narula is attending our events. That's fantastic. <laughs> let, me, let me paraphrase Daniel's uh, point while, he's, while he turns on his mic. So he brings up the issue of the importance of entrepreneurship in basic education. Uh, and, uh, you know, that it, entrepreneurship is something that should be happening at the grassroots level at the, for the youth, the primary schools. And we see this actually to some extent. So I think that maybe we can ask our, our audience to our, our panelists to comment on this as well. And, uh, Inka, I'm sure you are, you are nodding your head. I can see that you you want to come with this. Um, indeed, it's a, that's a great question. And um, again, it, so I'll speak to my own practical sort of experience growing up in Nigeria and attending you know school in Nigeria. We did have what we call business studies happening right from primary school. Um, let's not go into the content of the curriculum of that business study subject. And that was because as, as back then, you know, what the things we would have called the essential, you know, you know, the joke back then was that everyone was being trained to become a civil servant. So the sort of the, 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 the content of the, of the subject was geared more towards administration, business administration, um, but never really things around, you know, marketing or things like that. You did accounting, bookkeeping, and all those sort of things that were considered extremely vital to um, business success as a then. And that was right from, from primary school. Did that in any way sway my interest in management education now that you call me a management person? Obviously not. In fact, it made me hate it because of the way it was taught. Um, but going back to what we currently have in terms of systems, I think there is a decentralization of what I would call the sort of approach to entrepreneurship education across the different levels of education. I'll give you an example. If you go to a super good private school in Nigeria, the chances are that you will get exposure to even tech skills like coding, programming, and all this extracurricular stuff 
that builds your capacity as a young student. But again, you would agree with me that that is not the story of every of an average African child. Um, so if you say, take it back to the grassroots, we need to punctuate what we really mean by the grassroots. If we mean embedding this into public education or making um, entrepreneurship education a, necess a necessary component of what we teach our children um, from whatever age, well, we, we then need to sort of begin to discuss the operationalization of that, because um, from my point of view and from what I see, we, we will have significant challenges with getting, of course, except we're able to get build a, a robust um, sort of um, human resource framework around it. It can be quite a tricky thing to implement um, at this very stage. And that's why I think for, 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 for what governments are trying to do at the moment, um, we, we do have a lot of young people who are building programs for, those, for that grassroots level and social innovation experts and all these wonderful NGOs doing good work there. And going back to the idea of partnerships, maybe this is where those partnerships become critical for us to harness these resources in being able to implement what we want to see at the grassroots level. But in, again, it, there is no absence of entrepreneurship education in the grassroots stage as it were. It's just that we can't affirm the quality and the impact of what's happening there. And there is indeed also what we will call um, the innovative independence of schools um, depending on whether they are, or depending on what spectrum they are and their commitment to the full child development um, across our, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the education landscape. So that would be my sort of walking thought to that. But yes, very valid question and very valid thought. And following up on behalf of Dino, uh, who, by the way, is, uh, was my classmate in Barewa, so he knows the Nigerian situation quite well. Um, and uh, but the, the, I think the point comes to your earlier uh, about quantity and quality. There's a lot of education offered, but the quality is the issue. You know, we learn about basics, but then how is it practically applied and how is it useful in a, in a practical way is often uh, the challenge. Uh, so, yes, indeed. And uh, you know, I believe uh, Aloysius is coming in on this. Aloysius is a Dunning Africa fellow. And uh, he has a question here, which um, uh, uh, the, the channel, I mean, entrepreneurship at, gross, at grassroots level, we have the, the problem of government. So how do we challenge this? How do we challenge this and making this a reality? Uh, and I, I think uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from East Africa. And I know we have people in the, in the room with the East African experience. Perhaps they can speak up here. Why, why should they get prepared? I would like to uh, ask Professor uh, Bernard Ashrini to uh, share with us his views on how entrepreneurship education can uh, be successful in unlocking mindset. Professor, I know you are working very hard on a full curriculum about uh, entrepreneurship at the University of Lomé. Can you share your views on that, Professor? Oui, merci Jean-Pierre. Euh, très bien pour la question. Euh, on en a parlé même aujourd'hui, Herman et moi. Alors, pour donner encore plus d'ampleur à notre institut et pour bien maintenir ce partenariat, il va de soi. Il est fondamental que nous créions dès l'année prochaine un master. So, un master... Professor, uh, Professor Ashrimi is, uh, is sharing with us a disruptive uh, information that uh, as soon as September 22, University of Lomé will open an international Master of Science in Entrepreneurship. Alors, nous sommes en train de réfléchir sur le, le thème. De toute façon, l'entrepreneuriat aura euh, une forte portée dans ce ma euh, master. Alors, nous sommes en train de réfléchir s'il faut être euh, entrepreneuriat et innovation, mais de toute façon, l'entrepreneuriat est le socle de ce master. What I want to, to share with you also, uh, hand in hand with Professor Ashrimi, and that's very much to answer the, the question that has been raised by Judson, but also the very uh, critical highlight of Professor Naola is that this uh, master that will open, Master of Science that will open in September 22, will not be a standalone master. The master will be equipped with an incubator, an innovation fund to give money to the best project, I have said to give money to the best project, plus a seed fund to, to invest into the best project in due course. So by bundling a very uh, knowledge-driven curriculum 
the Master of Science in Entrepreneurship at the University of Lomé in partnership with NLA Business School with an incubator, an innovation fund, and a seed fund. We think that it's the beginning of the answer to the question, bridging the knowledge economy with uh, the, the business society and having impact on the economy. C'est l'occasion uh, aussi, Jean-Pierre se plaît, c'est l'occasion aussi de demander à nos amis de nous, de nous aider, d'apporter de, leur soutien dans le cadre de cette formation de master. So, very much in the Ubuntu style, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Ashrimi is opening a call for participation, a call for team building. Uh, all the institute is, team is very open to any type of contribution. Um, thank you so much, uh, Bernard. Is there, uh, Barry, now you, you have uh, got reconnected fully to the meeting. Have you spotted any question from the uh, audience? Lineo yes. is connected. Yes, there's somebody uh, asking a question. Esso Hanam, uh, if you want to connect. Oh, there you go. So uh, he, has, he, has the copy, he has the question in the chat. Are you born an entrepreneur? Is there an, Afri is there an African entrepreneur different from uh, his country? Uh, let me paraphrase this. Uh, I think counterparts. The, yeah, counterparts. Is the social and political environment um, over-determining uh, over the emergence of the entrepreneurial function? And can we encourage the blossoming of such a vocation? I would like to uh, get a I'd like to hear the response to this question. Adenka, I think it's for you. I'm um, sure. Thank you very much, um, Simliwa, for that um, question. I think it's the same classic um, question we always hear about: Are leaders born or made? Are entrepreneurs born or made? Um, at Henley Business School, one thing we believe quite firmly is that let's not believe that there is such thing as entrepreneurial genes. You know, it can be taught. Mm -hmm and you can become an entrepreneur and you can learn to become an entrepreneur and a very good one for that matter because fundamentally for us, our philosophy is that entrepreneurship is a mindset and mindsets can be coached, can be trained, can be developed um, and you can be taught to become an entrepreneur. That said, you could be born with certain dispositions and personality capabilities that could be strengths for entrepreneurship adventure. But that doesn't in any sense make you a great entrepreneur. They can be contributory um, and they could be leveraged in making yourself a good entrepreneur as you develop your entrepreneurial identity, but they don't in, an, in their own sense make for success. Um, and so that's one thing. So you entrepreneurs are made. You, you learn it, you become it, you grow into it. Um, and, that's, and you'll find many examples of people who weren't necessarily born into any sort of entrepreneurial background or people born into business as we call it who have gone on to build very successful businesses. And that's a story you find across um, some of our many entrepreneurs in Africa. Um, in terms of context, um, there, is, there, there is one thing we must understand here about context, that as it is with every important venture, we don't exist in isolation, we exist in context. And context plays a huge role in the forging of what happens, who we are, what we become. And there are quite a lot of interesting studies around you know, context and context interaction with people and with um, either from an ethics point of view or from an entrepreneurship point of view. Are we different from our counterparts in Europe and, and Asia and all that? Of course, we're all different human beings and our contexts are radically different. Um, but one thing we know also is that in Africa, the uniqueness of our context, however you choose to define context, because context is multi-layered, and however you choose to unpack context, either from an institutional theory point of view, or you want to look at it from just a point of view of um, um, engagement of um, different systems, either the very formal or the informal, or the very colonial and post-colonial, however you want to unpack it, context is, is, a, is a good way for uh, creates an opportunity for people to discover themselves and to really build resilience where there are no limit, where there are no enabling factors. And that's why even in Africa today, we can argue that yes, we don't have good enabling environments for businesses, but yet we are building businesses 
that are doing very well and young people are pulling through through the power of resilience. So yes, in a way, context plays a role. But one thing we're, of course, trying to say here is that, yes, whilst the enabling environment may not be 100% there, as you may be, as it may be compared to some other parts of the world, um, what we are looking to achieve with what we're doing now is to start to create that enabling environment for um, entrepreneurs to thrive. Um, and I think if you say, can we encourage the blossoming of entrepreneurship? This is exactly what we're doing. This is what all the programs we're trying to do is about. And if anything at all, um, what, we, what we're looking to also build, like let me borrow Jean-Pierre's words, is our own African method to things. When We're trying to find what works for us. We're not trying to get a system that has worked elsewhere and try to superimpose it into our own context. That's why we're building from ground up. And yes, everything we're trying to build is to create scalable systems, that is systems that we can replicate in other parts of Africa in order to build and in order to help other young entrepreneurs who may have ideas and who may have um, opportunities to really translate those opportunities into reality. So I hope that answers your question, but you've asked a set of really interesting and very powerful questions. And that will be sort of my abridged response to them. And of course, there are, there's more room or more scope for engaging and conversing on these points. Thanks, Adienka. Um, I'm reading the, the continuation of the chat. Uh, no, just uh, thank you. Thank you, Adienka. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, and that's, that's it for questions in the chat. Anybody else uh, want to raise their hand, grab the mic, post something in the chat for either of the three professors? No, nothing, uh, nothing coming, nothing coming forward. Um, Jean Pierre, do you want to start uh, the the the? Oh, here we go from Aloysius. Uh, I'd like to hear more about the youth digital revolution in Africa and perhaps the tech booms, the the three waves of tech booms that Arienka mentioned earlier. I think I think that's a, that's a fantastic question, and I I would. I would like Professor Herman, you are a philosopher, and 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 in the meantime, you are the the director of an, an another institute in University of Lomé, doing a lot of research about the semantic of digital. Uh, pour vous, Professor uh, Herman, quel est le sens et qu'est-ce qui est en train de se passer en termes de révolution digitale en Afrique? You have to. Uh, uh, you have to unmute yourself, Herman. Ouais. Voilà, c'est fait, c'est bon. Merci, Jean-Pierre. Euh, euh, je crois que euh, en termes de révolution digitale en Afrique, euh, pour, les jeunes, pour la jeunesse, euh, on peut déjà s'en rendre compte dans euh, l'impact que le digital a dans la façon même de réfléchir aujourd'hui et dans la façon, dans la nouvelle façon même de poser les problèmes qui sont les nôtres et dans la façon de leur trouver des solutions. Le digital reconfigure notre état d'esprit et c'est en cela qu'il est un appui intéressant pour euh, euh, l'état d'esprit entrepreneurial. Euh, comme je l'ai écrit dans le chat, on, on ne doit pas penser l'entrepreneuriat comme étant une fonction, mais c'est un état d'esprit et dans la promotion ou bien dans l'avènement de cet état d'esprit et dans le partage des, des effets de cet état d'esprit, le digital intervient comme un, un, un catalyseur, un puissant catalyseur pour euh, euh, amener la jeunesse à penser beaucoup plus rapidement et face à la complexité de nos sociétés aujourd'hui. C'est ce que je peux dire rapidement. Le digital a ce pouvoir-là de d'inciter de, 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 à une autre façon de réfléchir, à une autre façon de poser les problèmes qui sont les nôtres, à une autre façon de, de leur trouver les solutions. C'est en cela que il contribue à, à, à au renforcement et, et de l'esprit innovant et l'esprit créatif. 
Merci beaucoup, uh, Herman. Thank you, Professor Herman. I think we, we, I'm sure everybody has understood because it was very clear that uh, first of all, we should, we should be conscious how fast and, and how innovative the digital transformation of Africa is running. Africa is ahead of the, the digital transformation. Africa is pioneering with the digital transformation. Mobile money, uh, uh, tech, uh, fintech, uh, uh, agri-tech. Uh, again, Africa is pioneering because with less legacy, with less 18, uh, 19th century type of industrial legacy, Africa is absolutely pioneering. And that is a catalyzer of, of mindset for the youth to uh, grow faster with uh, uh, their entrepreneurial spirit. Adeinka, do you want to very briefly, and then we will wrap up and, and drive the, the day to a close, but Adeinka, do you want to build from that how the, the digital revolution in Africa is uh, so impactful on the youth and such an opportunity for the youth? Um, thanks um, very much, Jean-Pierre. Um, I think the, the way to sort of phrase um, what you've said before I sort of just walk you through what I have, tip, you know, sort of um, from my own understanding, um, we'll call the waves and the eras of the tech revolution or digital revolution in Africa, is that we are now beginning to see the, the use, the technology as a sort of silver bullet. Um, and that's why after every industry we have in Africa, there's always a tech behind it now. So you have agri-tech, you have a meditech, you have um, edutech, you have all the techs going after everything. Even now we have civil tech, which is sort of driving, um, um, you know, a participation of the, of, the, of, the, of the population in governance and holding governments accountable. So we're now even using technology for accountable um, government practices um, in Africa. So that, this, this is very important, but we didn't, we didn't arrive here overnight. Um, I think for me, um, this whole thing started in in 1995. It was um, it was Eric Osiakwan who, in 2017, you know, came up with this what we call what he called the King's Revolution, which is pretty much this um, five African countries where things sort of emerged: Kenya, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa. And some of you might be wondering why Ivory Coast. Well, Ivory Coast because Ivory Coast has 90% mobile penetration, and these are some of the stories, untold stories. Countries like Togo have incredibly good, you know, internet. Um, connectivity and mobile network penetration in, 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 in those countries. And these are things that power some of these um, behaviors and trends we're seeing. But from a high level, from a very high level, the digital revolution kind of started in 95. I put them in, in tranches of five, five years. Between 95 and 2000, um, we, what we had was what I call the infrastructure era. It was the era where we began to have the proliferation of ISPs, internet service providers. Um, you remember the dot-com boom and everything else that happened? It was all because we began to have this sort of, um, you know, in, in, sort of increase in internet service providers. We began to have, you know, dial-up connection happening. In fact, the, in, in a country like Nigeria, the Nigerian Communications Commission gave 38 internet service provider licenses within a very short period of time, 38, meaning 38 companies became eligible to provide internet services. That was unheard of. That was a huge, huge move. So we had this infrastructure era that spanned five years. Beyond infrastructure era, we then began to have what I call the knowledge era. This was between 2000 and 2005, 2010. Um, the, 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 the knowledge era was what I call the cyber cafe movement. You, 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 if, if you're old enough, you would understand that there was a particular period in time where cyber cafes were just, you know, every corner you turned to, there was an opportunity for you to jump on a computer and browse the net or soft the net for a little fee, for 30 minutes, a little fee um, for one hour. And this was for us the point where we, we began to see the quiet revolution begin to happen because the moment knowledge became decentralized and people had access to it. So at the, at the very first wave, it was still quite expensive to access the internet. Um, you know, it was, you had to have it privately or you had to have it in business. And it was very expensive because they used dial-up connections. As of 2000, we began to have better um, digital infrastructure to power internet provision. But more importantly was that the consumption of this digital infrastructure began to show up in the form of the boom in the cyber cafe business and businesses. And a lot of young people began to connect with the outside world at unprecedented rate. This was where we began to see the, the sort of breakthrough in some of the thinkings that we began to see. In fact, it was way back in that era that we had a company called InterSwitch that came up with the first sort of 
you know, card payment solution, which people thought it was crazy because it began to say to us, we're going to head towards a cashless society. Today in Africa, it seems like a bizarre thing if you run a business and you don't have a POS for people to swipe their cards. You, it's almost like an unheard of thing. And I think we moved on to the final stage, which is where we are now, which is what I call the skills era. So you imagine that from the infrastructure era to the knowledge era, we're now at a point where the emphasis is on digital skills, building digital skills, because now we're knowledgeable. Now we've got infrastructure. We're not trying to build the skills that will leverage the knowledge and the infrastructure we have to build businesses. And that's what is now driving a lot of the innovations that you're seeing across Africa. So in a way, even though I put them in waves, it doesn't mean that the eras are over. The eras are actually all still coexisting. But what it's important to note is that we've evolved. And this has been easily a 25 odd year journey for Africa in what we're seeing now as the boom in this sort of young people building businesses um, and building digital enterprises. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adinka. I was about to uh, wrap up. And suddenly, Catherine uh, Anyaou raised her hand. Catherine, are you able to jump uh, on stage and, and, and ask the final, the last question of today? Okay. You have three seconds to perform this technical uh, endeavor. Oh. You are there, Catherine. Fantastic. <laughs> yes, I am. Okay, so I know that obviously the digital um, sector is booming now in, Niger in Africa, but I feel like the main problem now we should focus on tackling is adding value to, um, let's say, the agricultural sector in terms of manufacturing. With Africa, we import majority of what we use as a country, what we consume. So we need, how are we, what are we doing to shed more light or to make it more attractive for youths like people like me to actually be eager to invest in value creation in terms for agriculture or even the production of tertiary products that can be consumed by everyday um, people in Af across Africa. Because I believe that's the major problem, one of the major problems we're facing in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And I'm going to take this question and to use it to start the wrap up. When we started four years ago, it was all about digital innovation in Africa when we started our journey. But you know what? The more we walk the talk, the more we engage with uh, agriculture, fashion industry, creative industry, musicians, and I'm, I'm hearing from the sport industry, knocking at the door of the incubation process and platform we are building. In Togo, the eight projects that we have started uh, six months ago, one third of them, they are about agriculture, how to reshape agriculture. And since then, the war in Ukraine has made it even more important to do this. So uh, thank you for that, Catherine. We can't dig further into this critical question of the sectors that we can support, but I'm sure that further uh, Dunning Africa Center webinars will deep dive into this uh, question. It's now my uh, honor to say thank you, Dr. Adinka Dewale, for uh, your contribution to that. Thank you, Professor Herman Mausse Akue Adotevi, it was amazing to have you from Lomé tonight and to benefit from your enlightenment. Thank you so much, Bernard, Professor Bernard Tosu Ashrimi. Uh, we had an amazing uh, evening. And thank you, uh, Professor Naroula, to uh, be the founder of this amazing initiative. Uh, thank you, Métisware. You are a fantastic team and you make technology almost uh, seamless. Before I hand over to my friend Barry, I just want to share with you uh, a final uh, wrap up. What is it we have been dealing with tonight? It's a very, very simple concept. It's African ownership of Africa. If we are able to participate all together by joining forces to the emergence, the emerging of African entrepreneurs. Yes, there is a pathway to African entrepreneurship as 
highlighted by Dr. Adeinka, Professor Ashrimi, and Professor uh, Herman. If we are able, as a second layer, to forge an African framework to support entrepreneurship, then we will unlock three things. First of all, we will unlock new profile, youths that are going to shift from job seekers to job creators. That is the only way forward when we think about reconciling demography and employment in Africa. That's the first thing we are going to unlock. Second, the second one is of critical importance. All of you, all of us, we need to focus on it. African investment for African entrepreneurship. That is of critical importance. Africa is a very, very, very wealthy continent. It's not that people are rich, not at all. We all know the issues of poverty, but there, there is a lot of wealth in Africa, massive amount of wealth. How to convert this reserve of wealth into African investment for African entrepreneurs and somehow compete against foreign money trying to steal somehow African innovation. That's the second thing to unlock, African investment to support African entrepreneurship. And the third thing that we can unlock tonight, well, not tonight, but through this uh, project, this platform, this community uh, energy, is to realize with, with pride that African is a global economy, is a global market. If we are able to break the boundaries, equip Africa with a financial SWIFT system to exchange money, if we are able to make entrepreneurship a catalyzer of communication between innovation in Ghana, innovation in South Africa, in Botswana, in Nigeria, in Niger, then Africa will definitely be a thriving global market by itself. It's now uh, my duty to confirm that, uh, that the recording, I've just been told that the recording will be available on uh, YouTube and other media. And uh, I'm going to thank you all again. All of you, uh, we had a, a very sustained level of attendees. You are still there. Nobody left uh, tonight. That's a very good sign from my perspective. And uh, also, I'm going to share my screen again whilst handing over to Barry. Thank you so much, Barry, for having host us uh, tonight. I'm going to share my screen so that uh, we can uh, discover with Barry's support what's up uh, for the next sessions, Barry. And good, good evening, everybody. Merci, Jean-Pierre. Um, thank you for, your, for your, your, your great facilitation and hosting this evening. Thanks, Dr. Alienka, to uh, the professors um, from the University of Lome. Uh, I look very much forward to, to continuing the mission with uh, the community that we're building here and all in service of the space that universities and business schools can play in building the people that, that build the businesses, that build Africa. Um, see you on the 4th of August for the next session, which will be around untapping the potential of Africa's creative industries. Looking forward to that immensely. And um, before we say uh, good night and, and leave you all to uh, go and have a well-deserved dinner, um, perhaps uh, Professor Rajneesh, you'd like to you'd like to send us all on, on, on our way. Are you are you still with us? Are you able to do the closing remarks? I am indeed, and I, I, this really this has gone superbly well. I'm very pleased with uh, the audience engagement, and uh, and really, I think we are we've done. And I'd like to thank Barry, John Pierre, uh, Adinka. Everybody has been, I don't know, 100% behind us. Thank you very much and see you next month. Creative industries is a very important topic for Africa. Uh, Barry is going to be here with a bunch of stellar speakers. So look forward to seeing you uh, on the 4th of August uh, at the same place at the same time. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Merci. Au revoir. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir.
À bientôt. À bientôt. Oui. <rire> Merci. Au revoir. Bonne soirée. Goodbye. Bonne soirée. Bye bye. Hello. <rire>